Hello everyone, welcome to the second lecture of topics in locally conformal color geometry. So today we will study in more depth some uh, examples of uh, locally conformal color manifolds. And we will use the criterion that we learned uh, in the last lecture, namely understanding uh, well the universal cover. So examples of compact LCK manifolds. The first remark is that we shall always be interested only in the non keller case. So interested in non keller compact manifolds. This is due to the following theorem of Weissmann in 1980, stating that on a compact complex manifold, a Keller metric and a genuinely locally conformally Keller metric cannot coexist. So in other words, if M is compact complex, and of Keller type, meaning that it admits a Keller metric. Then any LCK metric is actually forced to be globally conformally Keller. So is what I called last lecture GCK, globally conformally Keller. So if the manifold is already colored, there are no interesting locally conformally color metrics that we can study. Okay, let's prove this result. The proof uh, relies on uh, two important uh, facts from uh, complex geometry. The first one is that if we have a Kellerian manifold, of course compact, then the DD bar lemma is satisfied. And the second important fact that we shall use in the proof is a deep result of Coduchon. from 77, stating that any conformal class of a Hermitian metric admits a very particular uh, metric uh, with some special properties that is unique up to multiplication with positive scalars. So in any conformal class of a Hermitian metric. Omega. There exists omega zero, such that dd bar of omega zero to the power minus one equals zero. So this is the important uh, property that it satisfies. Okay, there exists and it is unique up to multiplication with positive constants. So up to multiplications with scalars. Okay, these are the two uh, pillars of the proof of this theorem. So let's use them. So let's take uh, let's take omega 
an LCK metric on M. Our goal will be to prove that <clears throat> omega has to be globally conformally tethered. By Godushon result, there exists omega zero in the conformal class of omega that I denote like this, so omega in curly brackets, such that bd bar of omega zero to n minus one is zero. So this omega zero is a Godushon metric. Okay, this omega zero is at the same time locally conformally Keller since we established last time that locally conformally Keller, uh, a locally conformally Keller metric will fill up actually all its conformal class with locally conformally Keller metrics. So omega zero is LCK, therefore it satisfies an equality of this type. In the omega zero is theta or omega zero, where theta zero is a closed real form. Okay, since theta zero is closed, one can verify that the following two form, the differential of J theta zero is actually a one one form or is J invariant if you want. So DJ theta zero is a one one form as a consequence of theta zero being closed. However, since we established that a Kellerian manifold, a compact Kellerian manifold, satisfies the D bar lemma, we can apply this DD bar lemma since we our MJ is a compact complex manifold admitting a Keller metric. So therefore, by the DD bar lemma. Dj theta zero, since it is exact, has to be dd bar exact. So it is dd bar of some smooth function f. So this is where we used the dd bar lemma. Okay, and now to conclude that omega is globally conformally Keller will actually conclude that omega zero is forced to be to be Keller. And it is just a trick of uh, applying uh, Stokes theorem for one integral in two ways. So if you look at this integral of dj theta zero wedge omega zero to the power n minus one, on one hand, this is the integral of dd bar f wedge omega zero to the power n minus one, right? Because dj theta zero is dd bar of f. By applying Stokes now, we can transfer the dd bar operator to omega zero n minus one. But omega zero is going to show, so this, terms, this term vanishes. So the integral is zero. So for this line of computation, we use the DD bar lemma in the first uh, equality and the Godushon property in the second equality. On the other hand, we can apply Stokes in the most basic way. And this integral will be equal to J theta zero wedge d of omega zero to n minus to the power n minus one. Right, we transferred the d to omega zero to n minus one. Since omega zero is LCK, so satisfies the LCK condition here. The omega zero is theta zero wedge omega zero. This term will be n minus one. times theta zero wedge omega zero to n minus one. 
So it's the integral of j theta zero wedge theta zero wedge omega zero and minus one times and minus one. Okay, but just by some uh, uh, linear algebra fact, very simple, we get that up to a sign, which I don't want to get it wrong, but I will just say generically plus minus. This integral is exactly the L2 norm of theta zero with respect to the metric omega zero. So on one hand, it's zero. On the other hand, this integral is a multiple of, uh, of the L2 norm of theta zero. Okay, but n minus one cannot be zero. So let's assume that we work in this setting. Actually, I should have put this at the beginning. So let a compact complex manifold of complex dimension at least two. So n here is, n minus one is clearly not zero. Therefore, we obtain that L to norm is zero and therefore theta zero vanishes, concluding this way that omega zero is scalar and therefore omega, our LCK metric from the beginning is globally conformally scalar. Okay, so from the very beginning, we have these uh, restrictions, uh, re this restriction. Looking for interesting LCK metrics means that we completely uh, forget about Keller manifolds. We don't look there for interesting examples. Okay, where should we start uh, the search of interesting examples? So as you probably noticed from <laughs> what uh, constraint I put on the dimension in the previous theorem. So in complex dimension one, things are not interesting. So there is nothing to discuss from the point of view of LCK geometry. Because in complex dimension one, both the omega and any theta with omega are zero since they are three forms. So on a complex curve, any three form uh, vanishes. So things start to get interesting from complex dimension two onwards. Well, in complex dimension two, we have a very deep theorem that was proven throughout many years and by many people stating that the existence of a Keller metric on a compact complex surface is purely topological. So we have this theorem due to Miaoka, Todorov, Xu, Buchdal, Lamari, stating that M J compact complex surface. So from now on, I will refer, I will uh, call the complex surface a manifold of complex manifold of complex dimension two. So a complex surface compact admits a Keller metric. if and only if the first Betty number is even. So we know from Keller geometry that on a compact Keller manifold, the first Betty number has to be even. So the, the direct implication is something known, is something known. 
that the difficult part of this theorem is to prove the existence of a Keller metric only by knowing that the first bit number is even. Okay, this theorem tells us from the point of LCK geometry that we shouldn't look for, for a LCK, interesting LCK metrics on those surfaces that have first bit number even. So the classification of compact complex surfaces is not completed, of course, but it is completed in the case in the Keller case. So first bit number even. This is complete. The non-Keller part is not complete. But still we can investigate which of the ones that are known carry an LCK metric. So what are the known examples of non-Keller surfaces? So the list is not very long and consists of the following. In Nue surfaces, Kato surfaces, Hopf surfaces, Kodaira surfaces, and properly elliptic surfaces. So in this lecture, we shall talk about uh, all these cases and uh, which one admits LCK metrics, which don't. But I will focus mainly on Inue surfaces and on Kato surfaces to explain uh, in detail their definition and how to find LCK metrics. Okay, so let's talk now about Inue surfaces. Inuit surfaces are divided in uh, three categories. And I will use the terminal, the notation that is uh, somehow uh, established already in the field. So these three types are called SM, S plus, and S minus, where S plus has five parameters. And I will immediately explain what these are, and S minus has only four parameters. So for the first class SM, M stands for a three times three matrix with integer entries and determinant one. N stands for a two times two matrix with integer entries and determinant one. P, Q, R are just some integers with the only constraint that R is not zero. And T, the parameter that appears only for the inner surface of type S plus is a complex number. Okay. So I will, uh, I will immediately explain more what I mean by these uh, letters and notations. But let's say that uh, what is the, the, the result that is known is that Tricerri proved in 82 that almost all in West surfaces carry LCK metrics. Almost all meaning SM, S plus with final parameter real and all S minus, all carry LCK metrics. 
And for the final class, Belgun, Karim Belgun, proved that S plus with purely complex parameter, this is that T is not real, does not admit, cannot be endowed with LCK matrix. Okay, in order to understand uh, their methods, we, we need to know uh, who are these surfaces. So I will start with the definition of SM. So SM is constructed in the following way. M I said is a three times three matrix with uh, integer components and determinant one and has one more restriction that M has a real eigenvalue alpha that is greater than one and two complex conjugated eigenvalues that are not real. So beta is different from beta conjugated. So these are the eigenvalues of M. So in US surfaces, M is uh, constructed out of such a matrix. Of course, there exists uh, plenty of such um, matrices. Um, <clears throat> Let us denote now by A1, A2, A3. An eigenvector corresponding to the real eigenvalue. So an eigenvector corresponding to alpha. So A1, A2, A3 are uh, real numbers. And B1, B2, B3, an eigenvector corresponding to beta. So B1, B2, B3 are complex numbers. Out of this uh, data, we will construct some uh, affine transformations in such a way that they will produce a compact quotient of C times H. So we define the following uh, affine transformation. Of C times H. So by H, I mean the Poincare half plane. H consists of all those complex numbers with positive imaginary part. So these affine transformations that are uh, four are the following. The first one is a, is a dilation. It multiplies the complex component with beta and the one corresponding to H with alpha. And the other three are just translations with the components of the eigenvectors. So GI of Z, W is Z plus BI, W plus AI. So for any I from one to three. So the Inue surface is M, is defined as the quotient of C times H to the group of transformation gener generated by G0, G1, G2, G3. So this turns out to be a compact complex surface. It is complex uh, because it, it inherits the complex structure of C times H and it's important that G0, G1, G2, G3 are uh, biholomorphisms. So they preserve the complex structure. So with J inherited from C times H. 
Okay, differentiably, so from as a smooth manifold, SM is a mapping torus of a three-dimensional real torus. So it is a fiber bundle over S1 with a fiber, a three-dimensional torus. And one can see that by defining simply pi of some element, which could be seen as a class of ZW, in this quotient of C times H to the group generated by G0, G1, G2, G3. So pi projects uh, an element uh, point in SM to the exponential of two pi i times log alpha of the imaginary part of W. And one can show that, of course, this is well-defined. I mean, uh, actually it's quite easy because the imaginary part of W is affected only by G0. So it's, it's obvious. Okay. So now, Tricheri put an explicit LCK metric on SM. By understanding that the universal cover, which by the way, we can easily see it's C times H uh, from the way it is constructed. So this universal cover carries a Keller metric uh, with respect to which the fundamental group acts by uh, uh, multiplication with positive constants. So SM is LCK. Since C times H, being the universal cover, it meets a color metric omega such that the pullback of uh, omega via G0 is a constant times omega and the same with the other ones. Gi star of omega is some ci of omega, where c0, ci are some positive numbers. Okay, this can be seen uh, in a very explicit way. And this is what the teacher gave. So if we take omega to be the following Keller metric on C times H, we can see from uh, the way it is defined, it's non-degenerate, it's positive, and it is closed. So it's a Keller metric, undoubtedly. And now if we take, if we want to check, for example, the first uh, property. So the fact that G0 just multiplies it with a positive constant. Who is G0 star omega? Well, it's just beta times beta conjugated times the Z part plus and now the, um, this whole quotient will spit out alpha squared over alpha to the third power. So it's one over alpha times the W part. But since M was a matrix in SL3 of Z. So this means that determinant is one. So the product of the eigenvalues is one. So therefore one over alpha is the norm of beta squared. So this is beta squared. So this is exactly beta, the norm of beta squared times omega. So this is C0. As for the others, 
it's even more simple. Since they are translations. So uh, this, uh, these translations are just killed by the differentials. So it means that the pullback um, of omega via gi is simply omega. Omega is invariant to g1, g2, g3. Okay. So according to the proposition that we ended last lecture, It means that SM is an LCK surface. Moreover, we can explicitly say even the LCK metric. So the LCK metric omega zero on SM is given by the pullback of omega zero. I mean, is, we, when I say that we can see it explicitly, it means that we can see it explicitly on the universal cover in coordinates. So the pullback of omega zero is I times imaginary part of W times DZ wedge DZ bar plus DW DW bar portion to the imaginary part of w squared yeah so if you look at uh, this form it's it's clear that is invariant to the action of g0 g1 g2 g3 moreover we can see also explicitly the leaf form so the differential of this form on c times h is The differential of the imaginary part of omega of W over the imaginary part of W wedge the form. So this is the Lee form. This is the pullback of theta zero. And this is exactly the differential of the log the imaginary part of W. Okay, so now we, we, we see explicitly what is happening on SM. Everything is, everything is very clear. Okay, I won't insist with the other inward surfaces because the same method is employed for S plus and S minus. Because both S plus and S minus are quotients of C times H to some affine transformations, G0, G1, G2, G3, that arise from the arithmetic uh, uh, properties of N. So these are very much linked, again, to the eigenvectors, the eigenvalues, so linked to the matrix N and those numbers that played some role in the definition. But still, everything is very explicit. Uh, a metric, a Keller metric on C times H, such that G0, G1, G2, G3 act on it by multiplying it with the positive constant. Okay. Um, why one of them, uh, one of the inner surfaces uh, couldn't uh, couldn't admit LCK metrics. So that was uh, the result of Belgun. This was because Belgun gave a presentation, a solved manifold. So he gave a presentation of inner surfaces N, P, Q, R, T with the final parameter non real as. So what is called a solved manifold? So uh, what is called a solved manifold would be a quotient of a solvable Lie group to a discrete uh, or compact group gamma.
gave such a presentation, actually, all the UI surfaces can be organized in solved manifolds. But uh, in this case, when the parameter is not real, the Lie algebra of this Lie group G is incompatible with the LCK structure. So I gave a presentation as G quotient to gamma and proved that the Lie algebra G is incompatible to the existence of an LCK metric omega such that the omega is the tau wedge omega. This was because he used some averaging uh, trick. Uh, he proved actually that the existence of an LCK metric would have implied the existence of an LCK metric that is invariant with respect to uh, the source manifold structure. It is invariant, uh, is left invariant to the action of G. And therefore, this transformed the problem into a linear algebra problem. Okay, so this being said, we close the chapter with the uh, inway surfaces and we move on with the other interesting class of uh, non killer surfaces, and that was Kato surfaces. Okay, Kato surfaces are obtained in a, a very interesting way. In the following way that I will try to uh, explain more uh, pictorially on a drawing. So we take. So the first step, we will have essentially three steps in this construction. The first step is to take a sequence of blow ups above the origin of the standard unit ball. So this B is the standard unit ball. So take a sequence of blow ups of B above zero. Immediately we will we will uh, draw a picture. The second step will be to take a holomorphic embedding of the closed ball in this successive blow up. So holomorphic embedding. Okay, let's let's uh, draw a picture at this point. So we have our unit ball B. We have the origin. We have a successive blow up, meaning that uh, we have here some exceptional divisors. Then we have a blow up that collapse on the origin zero. So this pi is a composition of blow ups, pi one, pi two, pi k. This is E and pi of E is zero. Now let's take sigma, a holomorphic embedding of the ball. So the image of, um, the ball via sigma is a relatively a relatively compact set here. So this would be sigma of the closed ball. We are almost done. The third step will be to cut the image of uh, 
this ball in the blow up. So define W as the blow up minus the image of the ball. So we are left at this point. So at this point, when we cut the image of the ball, this would be the cut. Let's say we are left with some sort of an annulus, which is simply connected because we are in complex dimension two. So we, we define this uh, B hat minus the image of the ball and we glue the two boundary components of this W. The two boundary components of W along sigma composed with pi. Because sigma composed with pi takes the big boundary to the small boundary. Because pi collapses the big boundary on the boundary of B, so on the sphere here, which is taken again on B hat via sigma on the small boundary. So we will glue these two boundaries that I am trying to uh, draw in orange. This is the big boundary and this is the small boundary. So we will glue them along this uh, real analytic uh, map sigma composed with pi. Okay, what we obtain is called, we obtain the Cato surface X by sigma, so associated to this Cato data called in uh, holomorphic dynamics uh, language. Because pi and, and sigma, uh, pi and sigma were the only foundations of the construction. This is called the Cato data. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we have three notable cases that we should understand in this construction. So case number zero, let's call it like this, would be when we have no blow up at all. So pi is, the, uh, is just uh, the identity but we can still recreate the construction. So we have the identity and we have a holomorphic embedding of the closed ball. So this would be the image of the closed ball. And we cut the image of the ball and we glue together along sigma. So we are entitled to do this. The result in this case, so X identity and sigma is a, what is called primary Hopf manifold. So it is a Hopf manifold whose fundamental group is Z and it is a quotient of C2 minus zero to a contraction, this sigma. The first, uh, the other uh, uh, particular case would be, so now at this point, we have actually uh, two cases to distinguish uh, between. It depends uh, where sigma of zero lands. So let's say that if sigma of zero lands outside the exceptional divisor, so now we are on the case when pi is not the identity. So we performed our uh, blow up. This is our blow up. 
me take our holomorphic embedding, but let's say that sigma of zero is somewhere here. It's not on the exceptional divisor. It is not, sorry. So if it's not, what we obtain, so x pi and sigma is a blown up primary Hopf manifold. And the most interesting example is when sigma of zero lands exactly on the exceptional divisor, on the last exceptional divisor. And pi is in such a way that uh, we always perform blow-ups in a point that lies on the last exceptional divisor every time. So pi was a composition of blow-ups, but uh, uh, we, we consider it in such a way that the blow-up number i is in a point that belongs to the exceptional divisor of the blow-up performed at step i minus one. So it's in such a way that we blow up successfully, successively points belonging to the last exceptional divisor. Okay, so in this case, number two, what we get is a called minimal cutoff surface. So in the sense that it is not the blow up of a cutoff surface already. It is not the blow up of another surface. Minimal in this way. I will say it is not the blow up of a complex surface. Okay, this would be our uh, three main cases. They are all locally conformally Keller due to this very interesting result of Marco Brunella. So every Kato surface it needs a locally conformally Keller metric. Okay, the strategy as it was before for the inner surface, but in that case, it was slightly easier from the uh, presentation that we had in the definition. The strategy is to understand the universal cover and put a Keller metric on the universal cover that is homothetized by the tech transformation group. So our eternal recipe. Strategy, put a Keller metric. Uh, omega tilde on the universal cover. Let's call it S tilde such that gamma star of omega tilde is a constant times omega tilde for any gamma in I1 of S. Good, so we are at a point when we have to understand the universal cover. It's not, it's not clear from the description what is the universal cover. So the description was very, the construction was very geometric. It was given by a gluing procedure. Okay, but as you might uh, have already 
understood. The universal cover looks in this in this way. I will explain it on a drawing. The universal cover is obtained by gluing together an infinite chain of copies of W. W was the annulus, was B hat minus the image of the ball. So the universal cover looks pretty much like this. I will call this W0. So on, so all of these are just copies of W, but I, I label them with an integer number. And all these glue uh, along the, uh, according to the gluing map that we have, which was sigma composed with pi, that was gluing the big boundary to the small boundary. So that is gluing this part to this part. So these are in infinite chain of copies of W glued along sigma composed with pi. Okay, so we have, basically we have the description. This is the manifold and Again, as you might have already understood just by this drawing, this means that the fundamental group of S is Z because this is how it is obtained. Z acts on this infinite chain by sending a point P to the corresponding P in a different copy. So this is gamma. This is the generator of the fundamental group fundamental loop is generated by this gamma. And it is indeed to, uh, sufficient to act only with, the, with Z because of the construction. And indeed, S still that uh, has uh, contracted. So by gluing this infinite chain is simply connected because since we are in complex dimension at least two, W, the analyst was simply connected. This is a phenomenon that does not happen in complex dimension one, but in, from complex dimension two onwards, it is simply connected. Okay, so now that we understand the universal cover, what is the key? The key will be to build a color metric on omega such that sigma composed with pi star omega restricted to a neighborhood of the small boundary is a constant, positive constant times omega restricted to the big boundary. So building a Keller metric omega, such that we have this, this property. So where u is a neighborhood, I will call it of the big boundary. So the external boundary of B hat, and V is a neighborhood of the small boundary or the boundary produced by removing, by cutting the image of uh, uh, the ball via sigma. So if I have to go back uh, to do the picture, so we said that 
Uh, okay, actually it's the other way around. So mixed up big and uh, little boundary. So U is a neighborhood of the small boundary. And V is a neighborhood of the big boundary. So this for us would be our V. And U would be a neighborhood of the small boundary. So let's do again a small drawing for the sake of completeness. So this is U. And this is V. Okay, why do why is the key here? Because after achieving such a construction, so after achieving this, we shall put on every copy of W in the universal cover. the metric uh, omega multiplied with a suitable constant, which will be for us uh, the constant C, that is uh, so the constant C that appears here that we want to, to find to the power E. Okay, in this way, so uh, this was the universal cover. It was an infinite chain of copies of W. So this is W0, this is WI, this is W minus I. So by putting here these metrics that are omega multiplied with the suitable powers of C, these, these metrics on every such patch will glue up to a globally defined metric on the universal cover. So this CI omega will glue up to a globally defined Keller metric omega tilde on a tilde. That on top of this has the property that gamma star of omega is C times omega. That's exactly what we want to deduce that the cutter surface is a unit LCK matrix. Okay, so the heart of the proof is here. To build a Keller metric on the analyst W with this property, but the pullback of the gluing map of the metric restricted to the small boundary is a constant times the metric restricted to the big boundary. Okay, and here I won't uh, enter into details. The problem is <clears throat> to start with a Keller metric omega on B hat. So to solve the key argument. One starts with uh, an existing Keller metric on B hat. So B hat was a composition of blow ups about the origin of B. So it for sure, it admits a Keller metric. It admits plenty of Keller metrics. We just take one. And after some analytic uh, treatment to this metric, we flatten somehow, we flatten this Keller metric uh, near the boundaries.
yeah, we modify it somehow using uh, uh, using some analytic arguments using current. And one can do that with uh, starting with any Keller metric that already exists on behalf. Okay, so I won't go, go here into more details since there's not much time. Um, <clears throat> but this, this is the uh, key argument that ends the fact that Kato surfaces admit LCK matrix. What about the other surfaces? So I will just say a few words about this. What about Kodaira surfaces and properly elliptic surfaces? So properly elliptic surfaces and Kodaira surfaces both admit LCK matrix because <clears throat> one can, uh, okay, I don't have much time to get into details, but they both admit some presentations just as in my services of C times H quotient to some transformations. So for properly elliptic surfaces, the universal coverage is C times H. And in Belgoon's paper in 2000, an explicit LCK metric was given. on the universal cover. For Kodaira surfaces, again, proven by ben Gun, they are quotients of uh, nilpotent Lie group. They are quotients of R times the Heisenberg group. And also here, explicit metrics can be given. So the recipe is more or less the same every time. Explicit computations. So far, the most exotic ones were the cutter surfaces that needed some uh, uh, delicate arguments with the constructing the Keller metric on the universal cover. Okay, and what about hop surfaces? So if you remember in the last lecture, we put an LCK metric on a diagonal hop surface, but hop surfaces in general, are defined as quotients of C2 minus C0 to a transformation of this type. A Z V W plus lambda Z N, where A, B, lambda are complex numbers and N is a natural number, and A and B satisfy uh, A and B and lambda satisfy the following properties. A and B have module at least one, uh, at most one, and lambda times a minus bn equals zero. So we say that the hop surface is diagonal when lambda is zero. Lambda is zero, the hop surface is diagonal. And in this case, it always admits at least two elliptic curves, namely the images of the two axes, z equals zero and w equals, equals zero. When lambda is different from zero, The only curve on S is the image of the Z axis. So here the curves are 
uh, we have at least two elliptic curves given by the two axes. So this would be the geometric uh, detection between the type of the hop surface. So we can, uh, we can say which type the hop surface is by looking at the curve. Okay, the key point is that every hop surface is finite, finitely covered by a primary one. And we saw that primary hop surfaces admit LCK matrix. Because primary hop surfaces are particular cases of cato surfaces, if, if we want, are degenerate cases of cato surfaces. And the argument, uh, Brunella's argument works uh, for them too. So admit LCK metrics. And therefore also the ones that are finally, finally covered by primary hope surfaces admit LCK metrics. So it's easily extendable, this argument. Okay, so this ends the, um, the list of, uh, of surfaces. And the next lecture, we will talk about higher dimensional examples. We will also discuss Weissmann metrics. And if the types that we, we put so far on uh, surfaces, uh, the types of metrics, if they are of Weissmann type or not. So just to give you the definition before ending the second lecture. So an LCK metric, Omega is called Weissmann if the Lie form theta is parallel with respect to the metric itself. So, in other words, if nabla of theta is zero and theta is not zero itself. So this is a very strong condition to impose on the Lie form. And we will see that the LCK metrics that are of Weissmann type will uh, be quite rigid. Uh, okay, so next time we will see if the metrics that we studied so far are Weissmann or not, uh, if there are obstructions to the existence of uh, Weissmann matrix and um, also about higher dimensional cases. Okay, so see you uh, next time.